1 Corinthians chapter 1, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for being a part of the study of God's Word. I uh, realize that you can go somewhere today that they probably are painting faces and having bounce houses and other things, but you chose to be here where we open God's Word and we study, and I appreciate you being here today. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, let me give you a little bit of an introduction to this. We're still on a mission theme, and I've titled the message, The Church, The Divine Design. Now, God has added a lot to our ministry in the last uh, year, a lot of new people. In fact, I'm coming through the lobby, and kids are out there. I think it must have been uh, Desiree McFadden studio, and they were playing in the lobby. And, and, uh, and I just thought, as I saw that, what a, a joy to have young people. You're not going to take me preaching, are you? You're going to take that away? Okay. I thought I was going to have him you know, just hanging on every word with the phone today. But uh, anyway, a joy to be in a church where there's youth, there's family, there's really a, a great balance that is here. And I just praise God for that. But as a result of that, I wanted to pause this morning and take time to review with you what the church is. Sadly, the church has become a place of entertainment now. Uh, it, it has become a place where uh, it's like uh, it used to be at go, going to Golden Corral. You know, they had this buffet, buffet the buffet yourself uh, menu. I don't know if they still even have those anymore. And you could just kind of go around and everybody gets whatever they want. And, and, and everybody's going to be happy. If you want a fish, you get fish. If you want steak, you get steak. And churches have become that way. Uh, you know, if you don't like the early service, you got the middle service. If you don't like that service, you go to the late service. And each one has a flavor to it. But what is the church? Is the church driven by the desire, quote, of the consumer? Or is the church driven by who God would have us to be? Uh, when you come to Hillsdale Baptist Church, what are you looking for? Why are you here? I come for the music, I come for the kids program, I come for the teens program. But what is God's reason for bringing us together and for us being recognized as a body of believers? Now, if you have been following my Heart of the Shepherd devotionals, you realize that we're in the uh, epistles of Paul right now. And we have finished with Galatians, we finished with Thessalonica. Galatians, uh, the highlight or the theme of Galatians is the gospel, God's grace through Christ. The highlight of Thessalonica was three virtues, faith, love, and hope. But we're right now in Corinthians, and I, it's towards the end of this two-year cycle, but I would still urge you, get in God's Word. And you're going to see that there's so much that God's Word has to give us. Now, as you have your Bible there, I want to introduce you to the church in Corinth. We're not going to do a verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Corinth, but I wanted to give you a little background because Corinth is a lot like our day today. You said, Pastor, how could it be that a church and, and a, a culture 2,000 years ago could be so much like our day? Well, in Corinth, there was a crossroads of cultures. And in the midst of that was a church. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, to the believers in Corinth, and he is emphasizing what you see on this PowerPoint. The need to guard the unity of the believers and the need to keep the harmony in the church. For instance, this morning... There are people here, and there's others that are listening online. You have left a church that had a lot of disharmony. You left a church that was torn by strife and difficulty. And so much so that it tore at your heart to observe disharmony in the church. Well, the church at Corinth was really no different. It was experiencing trouble as well. Let me read to you uh, a description of the culture of Corinth and see if it sounds familiar even as you look at our day. And so here's, the, here's a description of that culture. The population of Corinth in New Testament times was probably over 200,000 people. 
It was made up of local Greeks, freed men from Italy. Roman army veterans had settled there. Businessmen, governmental officials, and Orientals, including a large number of Jews that lived in Corinth. Along with its wealth and luxury, there was an immorality of every kind. Beginning with the 5th century B.C., the verb to Corinthianize meant to be sexually immoral, a reputation that continued to be well-deserved in Paul's day. That is from the Zondervan Bible Commentary. Now think about our nation today. Think about the culture that we're living in. Think about the promotion of ungodliness and immorality starting in the White House and going all the way through the local school system here in Hillsborough County. We are right in the midst of a melting pot of not only cultures, but a melting pot of ungodliness of every kind. Let me give you a description of the church now. Moving away from the culture, the church at Corinth. And I'm going to give you four qualities that was true of that church. The first quality is it was multi-ethnic. In our church this morning, there are people from different cultures, different places in the world. And that would have been what you would have found in Corinth. It was multicultural. It was also multiracial. It was a melting pot of cultures, religions, and races. There were economic differences. Going to the Corinthian church, there were masters and there were slaves. We could say there were employers and there were employees. And then there were religious differences. There were some who were Jewish who had come from the very strict background, even of the Pharisees, and they wanted the Gentiles to follow every point of the tradition. On the other hand, there were Gentiles coming out of idolatry and immorality and all manner of ungodliness, and they were all sitting in the same church. Now, that church, as you say on the PowerPoint, was experiencing disagreements, petty rivalries that were a part of the culture there. If you have your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 is where we're going to be reading. And you would say, Pastor, what was it that was dividing that church? And the answer is a polarization around personalities. Look at verse 10 here. It's on the PowerPoint, and you can follow in your Bible as well. Uh, Paul writing to the church, and he writes this, Now I beseech you, brethren... By the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. Now, what is he talking about? The same doctrine. And that there be no divisions, no schisms, no, no dissension among you. But that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Look at, that, look at, at this again. Speak the same thing. Have the same mind, have the same judgment. Now again, remember, they're coming from different backgrounds. The, the diversity in that church was, was that which could have frayed and torn. But instead, Paul challenges them to have the same mind, to have the same thought, to have the same doctrine. Notice this, and I want you to follow this today. The thing that they were urged to be polarized around was the Lord Jesus Christ. i say this to you this morning. If you and I would keep our eyes on the Lord and off of each other, we would know harmony and unity that is unknown in the world that we live in. Let me continue a little further. You have your Bible again. Verses 11 through 12. What was the substance of the contentions? What were they fighting about, preacher? Well, let's look at verse 11. It hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are at the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. So we don't know who this Chloe was, but Chloe had sent a message to Paul. We got a mess. We're, we're torn apart. There's fighting and division in the church. Paul, we got problems, right? 
Now continue, look at verse 12. Now this Paul writes, this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of a Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, Cephas being Peter, and I of Christ. So here's what they were fighting over, or the division was over. Different ones were following different teachers. And so some in the church in Corinth were saying, well, you know, I'm a Paul follower personally. You know, I, uh, he's the personality I'm following. And then somebody else would say, well, you know what? I like Apollos. You know, Apollos is an outspoken, he's a bold man. I identify with Apollos. And then somebody else said, well, I'm a follower of Cephas or I'm a follower uh, of Peter, meaning that. And then finally, some who tucked their robe a little bit and they said, well, I'm a follower of Christ. Now, the division, so we're real. Now, let's stop. I've been here 38 years. I've seen personalities come and personalities go. I've seen some of you rally around personalities. And when we do, we fail Christ. The unity that we should seek is not Pastor Smith or Pastor Peterman or anybody else that teaches in this ministry. The unity we should seek is the unity that can only be found in Jesus Christ. Let me walk you through a little bit more. And by the way, I don't know of any problems in case anybody's wondering, maybe listening on the air. I'm sure there are some. But I don't know of any, so that's not why I'm preaching this message. Let me take you to verse 13. In verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 1, Paul asks the question, Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Do you get it? Paul comes back and, and he says to this church group, some are saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ. And, and Paul writes and he says, why are you rallying around personalities. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Now think about the culture we're living in today. There, there are radio preachers. There, there are uh, preachers on the internet. Some of you, if I, if I looked at your phones, you would have all these podcasts that you follow and preachers that you listen to all week long. You don't know a thing about them other than what you think you know about them and who you listen to. You don't know anything about their life or know anything about their lifestyle. And so we have to be careful. When we, when we as a body... Focus on individuals will be splintered. But when we as a body focus on Jesus Christ, and he, he is our focus, now we will know true unity. Now, let me go another thought on, on this here. If you notice with, with me again, we're going to go on to verse 26 in a moment. But here's what Paul asserted. That his ministry at Corinth, or any of the other places, had not been about making a name or gaining a following to preach Christ crucified. He wasn't looking for a following. Now, I, I love you this morning, but I, I, I want you to know this. You call me and I'll do everything I can to be a blessing to you. But I'm not going to run myself ragged or crazy trying to win your affections. My desire is to preach Christ. And if your focus is Christ, you and I are going to love one another and walk together. Paul's writing then, he says, listen, my calling wasn't to have you follow me. It, it wasn't that I could have a, a, a name for myself, but my following was to preach Christ crucified. Let me walk you through some verses here. Look at verse 26, if you would, for instance. We read in verse 26, You see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, and not many noble are called. Now, let me, let me couch that with a question. Why would you and I stoop to following men when we have Jesus Christ? Why would we follow men when you and I have the infinite, eternal God whom we worship? 
And and so as you look at verse 26, Paul reminds us those who are ministering among the body, those who are called, the vast majority of them, look at verse 26, are not numbered among the wise men in the world's estimation. Uh, They're not mighty and powerful, and they're not even noble or called. Look at verse 27, verse 28. And so God calls men whom the world deems what? Look at verse 27. God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. One of the amazing things for me, I've been here 38 years, I've been a senior pastor now, uh, going on 28 years, is that you keep coming. Yeah, I'm the guy... First nine weeks, first uh, halfway through the first semester in my freshman year in speech, I came home with a D minus. Now, part of that was Southern, you see. <laughs> they, they had no idea what I was talking about when I got up to speak, you know. And, and it was almost that bad. It really was, you know. Where are you from? South Carolina. Now, I had to learn to stop that, you know. I I can remember going to voice. I actually had Patch the Pirate, Ron Hamilton, teaching me voice. And he had to teach me to to speak English, you know, like regular English, not Confederate English. So the amazing part, and I'll give you one other story and then I'll dive back into this. I'm graduating from college, right? Bible college, going into ministry. And I can remember, Sheila would tell you this is true, Lord, I will go anywhere but Michigan. (laughs) Michigan people had been a terror to me. How many of you from Michigan? Any of you? Oh my, all right. (laughs) I mean, I had been terrorized by Michigan people. And so I said, Lord, anywhere but Michigan, because I knew they would just rip me apart with my southern accent, right? And would you know where I ended up the next seven years of my life? I ended up just north of Detroit in Michigan. And so the old saying is, be careful what you ask for. I would say, be careful what you pray for, because God has a way of changing your heart. Uh, dive back into this. Look again, if you would, verse 27 to 28. Then what kind of man does God call? And, and I would say this to, my, to our, our young people and college students and, and some others that might be thinking about ministry. It's not about how great you are and it's not how talented you are. It's a question of whether or not you're willing to lend yourself to God to use. Look at verse 27 here then. Who does God use? Well, I'm going to go back to verse 27, Sheila. There you go. But God hath chosen the foolish things that is considered foolish by the world to confound the wise. They they sit back and they wonder, who on earth and why would God use somebody like that? Moving on. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and the base things, that is insignificant, Things of the world and the things which are despised, the despised there is to consider nothing have God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. The latter part of that is simply this. I'm going to sum it up in this. God chooses nobodies. God chooses nobodies. Somebody asked, uh, uh, asked me one time, we were speaking at a, a big gathering. And I'm sitting down at this table at, at the college that I had graduated from. I'm the, the Bible conference speaker, one of them. And this wonderful southern lady, she sits across from me at lunch. And, and she says, and who are you? And I said, um, Travis Smith. I figured she was probably from Michigan, but she had a southern accent, so, you know. <laughs> and, and, so, and she said, Smith. And then she said, would you be among the, and she started naming such and such Smiths, you know, like the, the southern uh, genteel would have done. And I laughed and I looked at her and I said, ma'am, my dad was a cotton mill worker. That was pretty much the end of the conversation at that point. Uh, you see, I wasn't a who's who, it was I was a who's he. Let me say this to you this morning, that's who God uses. The question isn't my 
capability. The question is my, ability, my availability. Let's keep going. Follow with me again. Again, I, I pray that this is so practical. I hope that it'll be a blessing. Uh, look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and tw verse 29. That no flesh should glory in his presence. In, in other words, I'm reminded that I didn't do anything. That anything that has come of my life and come of my ministry is not about me. It's about what God has done. And that should be the same for you. Now, none of us have a reason to glory. I, I can remember when we were moving to this location and, and the sign went out front. And, and I had the men say, well, you know, Pastor, uh, where do you want your name to go on the sign out front? And I said, I don't want my name on the sign out front. Now, that's not to criticize those who do that. But I don't think a ministry is about a man. The ministry is about Jesus Christ. Now, on your outline, let me give you some thoughts here in the time that I have. The first one is this, that Christ alone, the Word incarnate, is the basis of the harmony and unity of the church. If you want harmony in a church, let it be about Christ and Christ alone. A first thought that goes with that, a believer's loyalty and confidence, it should never be in a man. We should never be a people that says, I'm of Apollos, or I am of this, or I am of that. We should never be about the Bible college or the Bible seminaries that we're from. Because I can tell you from experience, they let us down. But you know, Christ never changes. You know, from the time that he saved me as a 12-year-old turning 13 years old, that Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. He's never changed. I've known people that have changed. I've known pastors that have changed. I've known evangelists that have changed. I've known churches that have changed. But you know, Christ has never changed. Here's the thought, and it's on your, uh, well, it may be on your outline, I can't remember. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30 and 31. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it, as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Here's another, a couple other verses, just quickly. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Why would we follow any other? Philippians chapter 3 and verse 9. And be found in him that is in Christ, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. In other words... There is nothing to boast about other than Jesus Christ. Here's another verse. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. From your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. But with the precious blood of Christ. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Again I'm going to ask the question. Why would you follow anything or anyone other? It's not about I'm of Hillsdale or I'm of whatever church you're from or wherever you went to school or wherever you got your Bible degrees or, or who you were saved under. Ultimately, it is about Christ. And he is the one that we find unity in. And so we go on, our glory then, verse 31, is not in man, but it is in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1, 31, according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. What a wonderful thought that is, and a challenge. Now let me take you a little further. If you have your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, this is the heart of the message now, the, at least the application of it. When Jesus Christ 
is the focus of our affections. And the Holy Spirit is in control. The church experiences harmony and unity in the midst of diversity. In our congregation this morning, there are different cultures represented. There are different races that are represented. There are different economic levels that are found here. We come from very different backgrounds. Humanly speaking, there is no reason for a church to enjoy peace and harmony. Humanly speaking, there's every reason for us to splinter unless Jesus Christ is our focus. You have your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I, follow with me as we read through this. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 12 through 14. For as the body is one, and it's talking about the physical body, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. And when it's speaking of Christ, it's speaking of the body of Christ, which is the church. Now verse 13. By one spirit, I want you to watch the word one. For by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. And so he, Paul is drawing a, a parallel, a, a diagram, an illustration, and he's using the physical body of man made up of many members and making an application or an illustration of that, comparing it to the church with all of its members, with all of its differences, with all of its diversities. On your outline then, consider this. The church in Corinth had experienced divisions and dissensions. Why? We've already told you. Because they polarized around personalities. It was all about Paul or Apollos or Peter. And then some would boast this way, well, I'm, I, it is about Christ. But the problem with that is they were all part of the dissension. Now you have your Bible, and I, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I'm going to go back. I'm going back and forth in the introduction. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul introduces what the problem was. The problem wasn't Paul, the problem wasn't Apollos, the problem wasn't Peter. The problem was a word that we find in the scriptures called carnality. You have your Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and it's up here. I'm going to begin at verse 1. In verse 1, we read then, I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. So think about it this morning. As we come here, we are at different points in our spiritual growth. Those of you who know Christ as Savior, there are some of you who are older, mature, you've got knowledge that many do not have. There are others that are in our auditorium this morning, some that are going to be baptized here in a few moments, who are growing up as babes, let's say, in Christ. Different points of the spectrum of maturity versus the young ones that are coming up in the ministry. And so Paul is writing here in verse 1, and he says, you know, when I speak to you, I can't speak it to you as though you are spiritually mature. Instead, as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Now here's the question. What is carnality. Well, let's go to verse 2 and 3. In verse 2, Paul writes, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. Hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. I got a picture recently of my granddaughter in Pennsylvania. She has started to get little teeth growing. And so she, she has these little baby biscuits or something like that. And she's gnawing on that. And she's starting to, to eat some edible things. And, and I'm watching her mature. In fact, my wife and I, we look at the pictures and we're watching. She's growing up. She's sitting up. And I told Sheila, if we don't get up there and see her soon, she's going to be graduating and, lie, you know, we're, we're going to miss the whole stage in life. But we've watched her mature from a baby. 
And she's slowly developing her taste for other things. This morning, some come to church and, and you listen to preaching and it just doesn't interest you. You say, I know the Lord, Pastor. But the basis of your knowledge or understanding may be lacking. And many of you, as I look out, you're, you're mature. You've studied this. You know where all of this is going to go in our study. Look at verse 3 here. You're yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? Listen, if you're from a church, or maybe even in this church, and you've been in the company of where there is strife and division. Make a point, a note. There's carnality. So the question is, what is carnality? Let me give you three thoughts that go with carnality. Here's the first one. Carnality is an affection for the world rooted in the sinful flesh of man. Carnality is an affection for the world rooted in the sinful flesh of man. When, when those believers in Corinth were saying, I'm a Paul, I'm a Paulus, I am a Peter, or another says, I am of Christ. What they were showing is a passion like the world. The world follows men. I don't know about you, but I look at people that are in high offices in our country, and I'm thinking, how in the world did they get there? And you know how they got there? They had a following. Politicians, for the most part, are not about serving you. They're about serving themselves. And in order to do that, they're going to tell you how great they are and what they're going to do for you. And you know, sadly, those are the same passions that are found in a church sometimes. Where it's all about the individual. I'm going to press on because of my time and, and having the baptism. Sheila, I'm going to jump forward a little bit. Let me give you another. Number two, carnality hinders spiritual growth and maturity. If, if you have a love and affection for the world, a passion for, for lust and, and the sin of the world, you will not grow spiritually. You will lag behind. You, you'll not have an appetite for things that are good. Uh, for instance, as I would go up and visit my granddaughter, and I don't know that she's had ice cream yet, but it would be a great introduction. But if she gets a taste for ice cream, you know what? She may not want some other things that are better for her. Agree? That is true of many believers in these United States. They've got a taste of the world. And they don't want a taste for anything different. That's why churches change their philosophy. They change their music. They change their style. Because they're trying to appeal to the world. Carnality. And they do so, listen, at the sacrifice of maturity in their body. Let me uh, uh, give you a thought that goes with that. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, again, I've already mentioned it to you. I fed you with milk and not with meat. I'm sure I uh, was introduced to steak and ribeye. I'm not interested in the veggie-based meat. Uh, maybe you are. Uh, you know, we're, we can grow this meat in a, 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 um, a, a dish in the laboratory and we'll just grow it and to make it something that you're going to like. Why, it looks like steak. No, I've graduated. Give me the meat. Now, I, I say that because that really should be the way you are as an older believer. That you say, give me the meat. Now, today is more milky, Okay. But there's a time for the meat. Let me move on. Here's a third thought that goes with that. Carnality then not only hinders spiritual growth and maturity, but thirdly, carnality is manifested by envy and strife and divisions. Let me describe this. Envy is supposing they were more favored than others. Strife, contentions, disputes, divisions, quarrels, splits and loyalties. And then finally, he sums it up and you walk as men. You're acting like the world. You ever have, uh, uh, some of you men, you ever have your wife tell you you're acting immature? 
Not that I've ever had that happen to me. But, uh, you know, or, or you're acting silly. Well, we understand what it means to act like men. And sadly, that's what happens to many churches. People become babies. And babies expect you to tend to them. But when we should desire to grow up and be self-feeders. Let me move. One, one other thing, I wanted to give you this. I know this is about granddaughter today. Granddaughter's wanting to use her own spoon now. Can you imagine what happens at, at a mealtime, right? You know, so I, I think my, my daughter-in-law gives her a spoon while she's feeding her with the other spoon. So she's got her spoon and all. And, I, and you know, Again, it's a great illustration of spiritually. Let me move on. Let me give you another thing. Carnality tolerates sin. Here are the sins that were in Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there was the incestuous sin that was in the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, there was all manner of sin and wickedness in the church. In fact, Paul writes and he says, you were saved from this. These are things that you should have put away. Let me read to you some of that. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. Neither fornication nor idolaters nor adulterers nor effeminate nor abusers, or, uh, abusers of themselves of mankind nor thieves nor covetous nor drunkards nor revilers nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. In verse 11 and then he says, And such were some of you. But you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. In other words, Paul says this is who you were, but it should be in the past. What you were in Greece, what you were in the world should not be who you are now. Why? As you look at the verse, you've been sanctified. You have been set apart. You have been declared holy. Here's what we need, mom and dad. We need your homes to reflect God's holiness. We need you as a father and as a mother to understand that the natural inclination of your children is to carnality. And just like you wouldn't tolerate your child wearing a diaper at 10 years old, neither should you tolerate an immaturity in a child that they should be growing up. You should be encouraging a maturity in their life. And you should be intolerant of carnality. But the problem is so many of us tolerate it in our own lives. Here's another thing that was happening in Corinth. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. They were having a division over lifestyle choices. Some were eating meat. Others weren't eating meat. They would have been offered to idols. And so there was this conflict that was resulting in their differences in lifestyles. And by the way. Lifestyles that offended other believers. You know, one of the things that you're going to find of a carnal believer is that they want their liberty regardless of who it offends. And that is a gross immaturity. Here's another thought. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Guess what they were fighting over in 1 Corinthians 11? The role of men and women in the church. And so Paul goes through in 1 Corinthians 11, and he does this great exposition on the fact that God the Father is the head or the authority of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the head of man or the head of the church. The uh, husband is the head or the authority of the wife. Now, I probably lost some people at that point, but the point is this. Paul was writing in 1 Corinthians, and he said, it's not about superiority, it is about divine order. You know, there's, uh, I think the uh, Southern Baptist churches right now, they're having this great division over the role of women in the church. Are you familiar with that? Uh, many of them are, are, are putting women in, in the pastorate now. They're putting women in the office of deacon. But when you read the scriptures, the scriptures absolutely forbid that. You say they've gotten away from truth. And then let me take you to my last point on your outline there. The church is the visible body of Christ. It is a living, dynamic organism. And Pastor Peterman, I'm going to let you slip out because you're baptizing, right? Okay, let me take you on. All right, let's finish this up and then we'll come back at a later time. So on your outline, here's the thought. The church is one body with... Many members. Now, 
as I stand before you today, I have a nose, two ears, I've got a big mouth, you don't need to amen that, I have ten fingers, ten toes, I have a good knee, and then I have a, I call it a fake knee, all right? I had a knee replacement years ago. So I'm down one member, but I replaced it with one, all right? Now, here's the thought. As our physical bodies have many members, and each of those members has its own function, you, as a member of the body, the church, have your place as well. One of my concerns that I see in our culture in churches today is that people don't want to identify with the church. And by so doing, it would be like a finger or a hand or an arm. I'm saying, well, I'm not going to identify with the body. I'm going to be independent. Now, you can have physical ailments that cause part of the body to not function. And when that happens, you might compensate, but it's not whole. It's not healthy. On your outline, let's wrap this up today. The church is one body with many members. And so we read in verse uh, uh, 12 then, or verse 27, the first thought, every believer has his or her place in the church. Just like every member of your body has its place. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. The word particular is each one having their own place or their own function. Now, we listened to a group sing this morning. We would say that they, they did a good job, right? They're singers. Now, there's some of you, if you decided you wanted to join that group, it probably wouldn't last too long because you don't have that particular talent or ability. Your abilities and your talents are in other areas. Let me walk you through that a little bit. Number two, then on your outline, every believer has his or her function in the church, the body of Christ. So everyone has their place. Now, here's another thought. Everyone has their function, the place that they bring gifts, talents, abilities, and skills. But understand this. We're talking about spiritual gifts. Now, follow with me on your outline then. Each believer is unique in the body. We each have our different gifts, our different ministries, our different talents, and different abilities. Let me give you three verses. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 4. Now, there are diversities or different gifts, but the same Spirit. Remember, one Spirit, one body, many members. Verse 5. And there are differences of administration. That is unique ministries, but there is the same Lord. Verse 6, there are diversities of operation. Operation would be talents and abilities, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. Now I'm going to go back up and look at verse 4. The word gifts there is a spirit-endowed gift that you were given by the Holy Spirit and that as you grow in the Lord, you develop. We could go into a whole discussion of that. I don't have time this morning. Some have the gift of teaching. Some have the gift of prophet, the, the, the foretelling. It used to be the foretelling, now it's the foretelling. Uh, some have uh, the gift of mercy, that is compassion. Uh, some have, and we could go on and on, I don't, I don't have time to develop it today, but there are different gifts represented here. My question for you, one, do you know what your spiritual gift is? Two, and are you using it? Another thought then. Two more and we'll close. Each member of the body is necessary. Each member of the body is necessary. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 21 and 23. Now he's going back to the physical body. And he said in verse 21, And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. The, the illustration of the body. Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. 
Those members of the body in verse 23, which we think to be less honorable, not as attractive, if you would, upon those we bestow more abundant honor, and our comely parts have more abundant comeliness. All right, as we sit here this morning, We've got our glasses on. We've got our hair calm. We, we're cleaned up. We look good. We came to church today. But we all put on clothing, right? There's certain parts of our body that we covered. And we're so thankful that you did. Because it's not always pretty, okay? And we could go into the discussion of what parts aren't pretty. But we're not going to deal with that. But my point is this. There is in my physical body, as it is in your physical body, there are necessary members of our body that are crucial. They're absolutely needed. I didn't know until over the last years, I've always known about the thyroid, but with my lovely wife, I started learning the, the work of the thyroid and what the thyroid does. Uh, years ago, I, I, I uh, had a, uh, a gallbladder issue and they took my gallbladder out and I'm doing all right. But, you know, I have to be careful what I eat because that'll get me in trouble. The point is this. There are some parts, some members of our body we can do without. But by doing so, we're not whole. The same thing. Listen, when it comes to the church, when it comes to the body of Christ, every one of you are necessary if you function in your place. And where God has blessed you, and where God has gifted you. That sometimes people will volunteer to do something, but they don't have the gift, or the talent, or the ability. And you know what happens to that believer? They become frustrated. And that frustration then leads to a critical spirit. Because they're not where they should be. And so it's a good thing to find your place. And then finally... Let me uh, close with verse 24 and 27 through 27. I don't have time to develop it, but let me walk it out. The church, the body of Christ, we evidence harmony with each other. Even in the midst of our diversity, when we value one another and exercise the sacrificial love of Christ. Let me read it to you. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 24. Our comely, that is attractive, our elegant parts have no need, but God hath tempered or composed the body. He's the physical illustration now. Composed the body, the body together, having more, given more abundant honor to that which lack. Do you realize this? The person that is in this congregation that is the easiest to overlook, may be the very one that God is going to bless in a great way when they take their place with us. I think about down the hallway in the nursery. You realize some of those ladies have labored in there for decades. And aren't they necessary? They have their place. If I took some of you and put you in the nursery with 14 kids, it would be chaos, wouldn't it? In fact, there would be some of you say, I'm never going to go there again. You see, we all have our place. Let me keep reading, then I'll make a final application. Verse 25, that there be no schism, no, no division in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And then when one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored or blessed, all the members rejoice with it. In the verse 27, ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular, you each have your own place. Let me close with this. Different message, I know. But I want you to know, those of you that serve in different areas here, I want you to know how much I appreciate you. I walked on the grounds on Friday. Hundreds and hundreds of people. It may have been a thousand like Pastor Barber estimated. And I saw my, our security men at different points on the grounds. Because you bring a thousand people together in this day, and bad things can happen, right? But you know, from the front to the back and through the middle was the security team that is watching out for me and you on Sunday morning. They were here. I looked out and our teenagers are part of running the booths. 
and ministering and giving a testimony to our neighborhood that, yeah, we're different. But we're here to minister. It was a place of joy. It was a place where people were serving. I walk by and the grill is running and people are cooking. And I can tell you, you don't want me in there. My wife would tell you, I'll make peanut butter sandwiches and I do a good job with that. But I'm not Pastor Barber. I'm not Summer Livingston or, or Shelf Sherman. I'm not those, those guys. I can't do those things. But you can. We have our place. We have our function. And so let me close with this. Sometimes people say, well, church membership's not that important. And I would say to you, it is if you're going to serve. If you're just going to be a spectator. But God didn't save you to sit. He saved you to serve. You will be more fulfilled in serving than you will ever in any other way or aspect of this church. Many members, each with their place, each with their function, and each serving. When we do that, God gives us harmony. I don't know about you. But I love peace and harmony, don't you? And God gives us that. But there's always got to be a vigilance in the body. Lest we become like Corinth. Divided. And schisms in the midst. The greatest testimony you and I can give to a lost world. Is that we can come from diversity. And in Christ, no harmony.